Once again, we're doing a series out of Romans. We're calling This Changes Everything, Making Sense of the Gospel. And today is going to be about marking the heart. We're going to pick up in Romans chapter 2, verse 12. Um, now I want to start by just telling you a little story about my, my childhood. Uh, one day when I was in fifth grade, we had a substitute teacher. And a bunch of the boys in my class had started every, they had gathered rubber bands and folded little pieces of paper up into kind of tight little like V shapes. Anybody ever made one of those little kind of rubber band shooter things? And every time the substitute teacher wasn't looking, they were shooting each other with these like little, little rubber band shooter things. And I was like, this is the best. This is so cool. I'm like, I need to have one of these right now. So I asked one of the boys across the table from me if he had another rubber band. And it turns out that he did. So I've got a little rubber band and I'm folding up my little papers and I'm making my little, I don't know if there's a name for these things, these little V-shaped things and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm playing along and we're having like the best time. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. And the substitute is kind of trying to maintain control of the class. And every time she turns around, we're like, pew, pew, you know, and, and we're having this awesome time. And then the next day, you know, our regular teacher came back. And he was really mad. Go figure. You know? And you know, he's like telling us, you know, a bunch of kids were doing this, and it was really not cool. That substitute teacher had a really bad day. You know, I don't think she didn't really get mad at us. I think maybe she wasn't like a really experienced substitute teacher. So we didn't know how much of a bad day we had made for her. But I think she must have had a really, really bad day because our teacher was really, really mad. And, um, and so for the first time in my life, I was benched and I had to find out what even being benched actually meant. So it was sitting on a bench during both recesses all week. And I'm sitting here with the other kids, you know, on the bench, and by the way, none of the other kids on the bench are white, and none of the other kids on the bench are female. So I'm like, I'm the only white girl, you know, sitting on the bench, and I'm asking the other kids that I'm sitting with, so like, so we, so what do we do? So we sit here, like the whole time. We can't play. Like, we can't play in five minutes. We can't play in 10 minutes. We can't play until next week. Like, this is, this is really unfair. I was convinced that I was being horribly persecuted and this was like the worst thing that had ever happened to me. And I found out that the other kids that I was sitting with actually felt guilty about our behavior. And I thought, wow, you know, we were wrong. You know, we were, we were bad, we misbehaved. We weren't supposed to be doing that. We were supposed to be paying attention. It's like, oh, I had the hardest time getting my mind around that. Like, what do you mean we were bad? We were just having fun. So. I really needed to, to learn from these other kids. I think that I was a little bit of what you might call self-righteous uh, about just feeling like we were having fun and we hadn't done anything wrong. The other thing that I learned about the other kids I was sitting on the bench, was, bench with, though, was that they actually believed kind of in their hearts that they were bad kids. And on the one hand, I could really learn from them owning the behavior. Hey, we did something wrong. We shouldn't have done that. But there was something that just seemed wrong to me, even at the time, even as a fifth grader. You know, why, why do these other kids think of themselves as bad kids? And you know, that doesn't seem right. You know, I thought of myself as wonderful. I think I naively went through life imagining that I was just a fantastic human. And I think it was because my parents loved me. And my parents treated me like I was a fantastic human all the time. And so I just believed that uh, just sort of as an automatic thing. And I think it was unhelpful to the extent that I was self-righteous and I had a hard time admitting that I had done something wrong. But I think that it was also helpful at the same time to know just that I was loved unconditionally. I wish that nobody ever had to go through life feeling like they were the bad kid. Um, Jamie and I have been learning a lot about family systems right now, and we have learned that, that a lot of times sort of a, a certain role is assigned to a kid in a family, and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with that kid's behavior. That, you know, sometimes a family assigns a certain kid to be the good kid and assigns another kid to be the bad kid, and that doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with how those kids act. It's sort of like the needs of the family that have just sort of put on that child. Now, I don't actually think that's what, hap what was happening in my family. I think in my family that if you were born into our family, you were automatically a good kid, which is a whole different dynamic. But, but, you know, but, 
But sometimes status as sort of the, the good kid has absolutely nothing to do with behavior, but has to do with self-perception or the perception of other people. Um, you know, last week we talked about human sin and you know, we def have defined that as unfaithfulness in our relationship with God, with each other, um, with even with ourselves, and how in order to make sense of the gospel, we really need to understand human failure as our own failure. Um, and that's not for the sake of staying there and wallowing in it and feeling terrible about ourselves, but in order to make sense of God's grace and to, to receive it in a real way, in a joyful way. Um, so this week, Paul's continuing on that theme, and the the... We talked about the church in Rome being made up of some Jewish Christians and um, a lot of sort of Greek and Roman Christians. And one thing that was going on with the, with the Jewish community is they're kind of coming out of this good kid identity. You know, we're God's chosen people. We're the ones who have God's special rules, the Old Testament law. And so we're not sinners. We're not guilty of this world's problems. We're righteous. And righteous is going to be a really big word this week. Um, in Paul's world, in the world of the book of Romans, it's a legal term that refers to the victorious party in a lawsuit. So it doesn't matter if you're the plaintiff or you're the defendant. If the court finds in your favor, then you are the one who's been declared to be righteous. Um, so this is the person who, after all of the evidence has been weighed, has been determined to be in the right. And so there's this feeling you know, among often religious communities that we're the ones who are officially in the right. We are the ones who have right standing before God. Uh, a note on this is we tend to associate the word righteous with self-righteousness. I think in our culture, we don't talk very much about righteousness. It's sort of a religious word. But we talk a lot about self-righteousness, and it's a negative. So I want to distinguish between uh, the two things. So self-righteousness, I looked this up in the dictionary this morning, is an unfounded certainty of one's own moral superiority. Um, so it's sort of an entitlement mindset. I'm entitled to win this lawsuit because I am the good, right person. And that's something that we don't want to be like. But when the Bible talks about righteousness, we're talking about a true righteousness that's actually about a goodness that's at the core of our being that's manifest in our lives. And this is something that's highly desirable. We want to be somebody who is good at the core of our being and who lives out our life in a way um, that's defensible. And so what Paul is doing as we take a look at this section of Romans is he's breaking down this entitlement myth. And he's not just doing it for the Jewish community of his time, but I think he's really doing it for all of us who are inclined to think that way. He's letting them know you're not a good kid just because you have certain ethnic, cultural, or religious markers. And he's getting them slash us you know, to stop thinking in a self-righteous way and to recognize that they're part of the problem. Um, and at the same time, though, I think a, a, an exciting thing is he's actually giving them that good kid identity back, um, but not as an entitlement, as a gift from the Spirit in an entirely new way that's got nothing to do with self-righteousness, but has to do with the true righteousness that comes from God. To all of those who, by their own life choices, have chosen to be the bad kids, that's us, but who by faith say yes to this invitation to become children of God. This is something which is still undeserved, but it's not something which is false. It's a true identity that plays out in our lives by the power of the Spirit. So I'm going to pray, and we'll take a look at the scripture. Well, Lord, I just want to ask for your presence here with us right now. Lord, would you just help us to understand your word? Would you cause it to go just down into our being? Would you continue to work your transformation in us? Would you cause your word to be a light that would guide us? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Okay, so starting... Oops, Joe's email is still up there. Here we go. Starting in verse 12 of chapter 2. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Uh, a simple paraphrase of this is basically people who don't have the rules are going to be judged based on how they live while not having the rules. 
and people who do have the rules are going to be judged based on how they live while having the rules. Um, the whole purpose of rules is to actually follow them and simply knowing them is irrelevant. Everyone is going to be judged in the same way. Um, we said a little bit earlier that righteousness is legal language in Paul's world. It refers to the victorious party in a lawsuit. Um, so I think we could actually compare this when we're trying to understand what Paul is saying here. We can compare this to uh, like a modern day lawsuit situation. We Several years back, we were researching insurance policies for the church, and we learned a little bit about sort of what insurance policies want from you, and it turns out that they want you to have a certain set of safety procedures. So for instance, if you're working with children, you need to have safety procedures related to working with children. If you're working with any other, whatever other situation, whatever it is that could go wrong where you could be sued, they want you to have a procedure in place for how you're going to handle things. And it turns out that if you have safety procedures in place, and you follow them, and you are sued, you will probably win. Because the court will look at your situation and they're going to say, well, they had a set of safety procedures in place and they followed them. They did everything that they could do to prevent this situation. This was an accident that's not their fault. And so they're going to be determined to be in the right. They will be found righteous. Uh, innocent of wrongdoing in this situation. It turns out that the worst possible thing that you can do is to have safety procedures and not follow them. If you have safety procedures and you don't follow them, then when people look at what happened, they're basically going to say, you know, yes, this is obviously a direct result of your negligence because you didn't follow your own rules and therefore this is your fault. You will probably lose. You will be the unrighteous party. You will be the, you will be the person who's found to be not in the right and you're going to end up paying damages. Um, so just having the rules is not only useless, but actually worse than useless if you don't follow them. The good of having the rules comes from following the rules. Going on, indeed when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Um, another quick paraphrase, in fact, when people who don't have the rules live faithfully, it's as if they did have the rules. Um, they don't have the rules, but they're listening to their consciences, and they're making course adjustments as they're going. Um, another way to say this is that they're listening to their hearts, and that their hearts are in alignment with what is good. Um, now, this concept of faithful living as evidence of what's written on the heart is going to be a really important concept that we're going to come back to later. Um, Romans goes on. Oh, there's a, I'm missing a slide again. Romans goes, goes on to say one more sentence that's missing. This will take place on the day when God judges everyone's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. And this refers to being declared righteous or unrighteous, which in the final judgment is a matter of life and death. So as a side note, by the way, notice that judgment is actually part of the good news. We talked about before the human cry for justice. So actually the fact that judgment is coming is in itself part of the good news because it's an answer to the human cry for justice. Now, Paul's going to go on, he's going to talk about this myth of special status. He says, now, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. 
So part of the story of Israel is that they have been commissioned to be a light to the world. The promise to Abraham and to his family is that you will become a blessing to all the nations of the world who will come to honor God because of you. And so what's being said here is, hey, if you're not living as a light, then you're actually bringing shame on God instead of honor. And people are speaking badly in the world about God because of you. Um, so the main point here, once again, is that Paul is breaking down this lie of entitlement. You don't get to be the good kid, the one who is officially righteous, the one who's declared to be in the right simply based on ethnic heritage or religious affiliation. Righteousness is not assumed based on membership to a cultural or religious group. Um, so this goes back to the question that's so important in Romans that we talked about the very first week of whether or not God is just. See, unlike many human justice systems, which actually are biased based on people's ethnic heritage or their religious affiliation, um, God doesn't play favorites. So what, what Paul is saying here is God's justice system is not corrupt. It's not biased in favor of some people and against other people. Um, and thinking about human justice systems, do you guys remember the death of Eric Gardner in 2014? Um, he's the one who, who died while kind of police had him in a hold and he was saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And a lot of people watched the video uh, of this happening. Uh, and I remember as I was watching it, watching that video, thinking that this seemed actually incredibly familiar to me. Because back in 1990, uh, when I was young and stupid, um, I had been arrested for trying to bring um, about a half a pound of marijuana across a Border Patrol checkpoint in San Onofre. And, um, and and my behavior at that time was very similar to Eric's. So it was kind of a deja vu sort of feeling watching this thing happen. Now, he was apparently selling cigarettes on the street corner, and I was bringing illegal substances through a Border Patrol checkpoint. So we were doing pretty different things um, when this happened. But, but when the, the police officers wanted to, to search me and to cuff me and, and bring me to, <laughs> to jail, um, I reacted very much like he did. I had a past history of sexual assault, and the idea of being physically handled by male officers was a trigger for me. And so I, I panicked, and I wanted to cooperate. I didn't mean to cause problems, but I couldn't actually physically get my body to cooperate with what was going on. And so like to whatever extent Eric was resisting arrest, I was also resisting arrest. Um, but of course, I... I didn't die. I remember feeling incredibly self-righteous that I had been handled roughly and I thought that I was unfair that I should be handled roughly while I was committing a crime, um, which shows I had not learned a great deal since fifth grade. Um, you know, but when I, when I watched that, I thought about my experience and I saw his experience. And I, a side note here is there's a limited amount of things that can be known from watching a video. And, and I just want to make it clear, you know, that, that, I don't think you should assign particular motives to somebody that you don't know based on a video that you saw. Um, so I just think we have to be very cautious when we think about these things. Like, what conclusions are we drawing and how certainly are we claiming them? So I don't want to claim anything specific about those exact people's motives and why what happened happened. But watching that, I thought, wow. You know, I can't help but notice this was really, really different. And I have to tell myself, you know, I think it was a really, really good day to be white and a really, really good day to be female. And it makes me just think, hey, you know, what might be broken about our justice system and, and how, can it be, how can it be healed? And once again, I think what, what Paul wants us to know is God's justice system isn't broken like that. You can know that everyone is going to be treated the same. Uh, I want to make one other just side note about that, and that's that you know when the police port report was written up, it was the the police lied about what happened. So what actually happened was that I was cowering against a wall with my hands in front of me. Um, but what they wrote was that I had physically attacked them. 
that I had actually assaulted them. And, and the reason I want to share that with you, it doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about right now, but I'm just, I'm looking around and I see us and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, most of us here at Coast, we spend our whole lives being the good kids. <laughs> and I think just being able to hear from somebody we know, hey, this stuff is real. You know, it, it happens that, that lies get told about what happened. Um, so I just want to, I'm going to put that out there just as a FYI. Um, once again, the key point here, though, is that, that God's system isn't like that. We don't have to look at God's justice system and think, maybe this is corrupt. Maybe some people have special treatment and other people's don't. Um, divine justice isn't based on a favor that's arbitrarily assigned, based on assumptions that are made about people, but everyone stands before God on the same footing. Now, Paul's primary intent here is to continue making the point that we talked about last week, which is to make 100% sure that everybody, including the Jewish Christians, recognizes themselves as sinners. I am part of the problem. In particular, that no one is righteous by default because of family identity. Um, but there's an important message here, and this is where Paul is pointing. So he's starting here, making sure everybody knows they're guilty, but he's pointing toward a point that's super relevant to us as Christians today. I mean, I think there's the same tendency among Christians to think of ourselves as righteous by default, that somehow or other by membership to the cultural or religious group of Christianity that we are righteous, that, that we are in the right and we have special standing because we belong to the cultural or religious group Christianity and then we ignore the hypocrisy of our own untransformed lives. And to the extent that being Christian becomes simply a cultural heritage, or to the extent that we imagine that righteousness comes from signing up for the right religion, or to the extent that we expect God to be biased in our favor, you know, regardless of how we behave, then I think we've really missed the whole point of what it means for us to be followers of Jesus. And in fact, a great deal of shame has been brought on the name of, the, of God in the world because of so-called Christians who have not paid attention to the way that they lived and imagined themselves to be righteous by default. You know, a lot of Christians associate you know, Islam with violence, right? You know, we, think of, we think of Muslims as people who are propagating violence in the world. But it's useful for us to know that in the Muslim world, Christianity is often associated with violence. You know, part of that is because of the Crusades, which were a really long time ago, but also part of that's because of American attempts to sort of police the world and manage other people's problems. But we need to be aware that, that how we behave reflects on how people think about God. Also, because a great deal of the West is nominally Christian, a lot of the non-Christian world associates Christianity with sexual immorality, gun violence, the things that people see on TV and movies, because that is apparently what Christians do. Um, and so a lot of shame is brought on God based on you know, people who are supposedly Christians not living out the life that we have been called to. And so Paul is at this time addressing the Jews, but he's also setting it up to be able to talk to to all of the Christian community, both then and now. Um, going on, circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a law breaker. Um, can I just stop for a second and say circumcision is a really weird thing to be talking about in public? Um, the Bible actually talks about this a lot. So I was thinking to myself as I was getting ready for this, I'm like, do you just go with it like it's nothing? You know, do you make a joke about it? As a woman, is it appropriate to make a joke about circumcision? Because usually, you know, you can only make jokes that have to do with groups that you belong to. So maybe if you're not a man, you're not allowed to make a joke about circumcision. So I thought maybe I wouldn't make one and I couldn't think of one anyway. But, and you guys know I'm not squeamish, right? But I think it's weird. So just a note, I think it's weird. But, but going ahead with this, well, 
this, this talk of circumcision refers to a tradition in the Jewish community where on the eighth day after a male child is born, the foreskin of the penis was removed as a sign of membership to the community of the people of God. So it's a physical marking on a personal part of the body that communicates family membership, communicates membership to the religious community, communicates being set apart um, for God. And here we read circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you've become as though you had not been circumcised. So what's being said here is it's meaningless to have the symbol of being set apart without the actual lifestyle of being set apart. In fact, if you have that symbol of being set apart and you don't live the lifestyle, the symbol actually becomes almost the opposite of what it is. It's a symbol of unfaithfulness. It's a symbol of everything that you're not doing. Um, this is a little bit close to home as a metaphor right now, but I was thinking how inaccessible the idea of circumcision is to modern day Christians. And I was thinking a lot about um, a wedding ring as a symbol of wedding vows, right? A, a, a wedding ring is a symbol of the vows that are taken when, when you get married, right? And it's meaningful as a symbol of those vows, as an outward physical marker, to the extent that those vows, that those vows are kept, right? I mean, and if those vows are not kept, then the ring itself is meaningless all by itself. And we could even think of it as being worse than meaningless because it starts to take on sort of an ironic meaning, a, a meaning of, of not following through with everything that it's supposed to stand for. So it can become sort of a mockery of itself. And this is what Paul is saying to the Jewish community is that circumcision is ac actually a mockery of being set apart for God if you don't actually follow through with the lifestyle that is meant to go with it. Um, another way to say this is that membership to God's family cannot be attained through human rituals. And once again, I think that this is relevant to modern day Christians. This isn't just a message for kind of early Jewish believers, but this is something that's super relevant to us today. Um, people often talk about baptism as being sort of a Christian parallel of circumcision because it's sort of a marker of entry into the church, into the Christian community. It symbolizes cleansing and it symbolizes death and rebirth by the spirit into a new life. But of course, it's again not meaningful unless, unless life is transformed, right? If we are baptized, but we don't actually die to our old life, and we don't actually enter into a new life, then baptism loses its meaning. Um, and I think that in Catholic context, in a lot of liturgical church context, there's a real danger of seeing baptism as actually equivalent to entry into the family of God. That that the, the people who are God's people are those who are baptized. Um, it's not so much of a danger in the evangelical community. Evangelicals tend to push back pretty hard on the idea that a ritual makes you part of God's family. Um, and so we tend to talk a lot about these are people who have actually made a choice, people who've said yes to the gospel. And so a lot of churches like Coast will baptize people after they've made that choice, you know, rather than as babies, as a way of saying, hey, this is really actually about a choice. But I don't think that it gets us off the hook of imagining that we can become members of God's family by a ritual. I think in, you know, in evangelical context, people talk a lot about the sinner's prayer. We don't usually call it that here at Coast, but we imagine that when we enter first into relationship with God, that we pray and we give our lives to Jesus, right? But it's easy for us to treat that as a human ritual that gives us entry into God's family, regardless of how our lives are lived or what else, whatever else happens. Uh, we tend to talk about this as a ticket to heaven mentality that we imagine that just sort of, okay, we, we do this thing, and then after we do this thing, we pray this prayer, and then we're good. And everything is fine, and you know, it would be nice if we lived well, but you know, it's not necessary, because we did the prayer, and so we're good. And I think this is the kind of thing that, that Paul's saying, you know, no, that's not, that's not how this thing works. And, and that's not to say that all of these are not really important moments in saying yes to membership to the family of God. But the danger, again, is thinking of them as something that changes only our status at a single point in time. Um, 
And what actually makes us members of God's pe people is an invisible action that God does to our hearts. It doesn't just change our official standing, but it actually changes the totality of who we truly are from the inside out. Here's what Roman says about that. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. This last sentence is a little bit of a pun because Israel means praise. So this, it doesn't just say your praise isn't from other people, but from God. But because you're talking about membership to Israel, it's saying membership to the community of God um, is not from people, but is from God. Um, the mark of membership to God's community is not on the outside, but it's on the inside. It's a mark that's made on the heart by the Spirit. Have any of you guys read uh, the book Tattoos on the Heart by Greg Boyle? Um, I'm not actually going to talk about much about the book. It's a book about his ministry, the homeboys industry in Los Angeles, working with gang members there. And it's a great book if you ever have a chance to read it. But I, what I want to talk about right now is actually just the title. I love the title because a, a gang tattoo is a, an outward physical symbol of membership to a family. And so I think this is actually a really brilliant way to express this concept in a, in a, from a modern lens, that, that we could really think of this as saying that the Holy Spirit tattoos our hearts, puts the symbol of family membership um, onto the heart, like, like a tattoo. Um, it's the Spirit identifying us as part of God's family. And once again, Paul's addressing the Jewish community, but I think that he's also addressing the Gentile community and that he's setting up this message that gets more and more clear as he goes along for those of us who've been grafted into the family of God, that being a Christian isn't about choosing the right religion. It's not about being baptized. It's not even about praying a prayer, but it's about being set apart for God by God who places his mark on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Um, we could talk about this as opposed to the lie of entitlement. The shocking reality of grace is that membership to God's family is received from the Spirit as a marking on the heart. Um, you know, today when we talk about Christianity as being about the heart, we actually tend to oppose the heart to behavior. There's this idea when we say something is about the heart that we mean that it's actually more important how we feel or more important what we believe than what we actually do. So it's kind of a way of justifying ungodly choices, saying, hey, it's okay, God forgives me, it's about the heart, right? But what Paul means when he says something is about the heart is actually the exact opposite of that. When Paul says that membership to God's family is about the heart, he's saying it is something that is lived. It's not just something that is believed. It's not just something that's marked on the body but it is actually something which, which is reflected in one's life. Um, and this is, I think, important, again, not just for the conviction of early Jewish believers, but also for us, that where this argument is pointing is that being a follower of Jesus is a matter of the heart. It's something which is marked on our hearts, and therefore it means that it's more than a belief. It's about our whole identity, and it's about the life that is lived out of that identity. Um, the consistent message of the Bible is that what you do actually comes out of who you are. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 6, no, tree bears, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Good people bring good things out of the good stored up in their heart, and evil people bring evil things out of the evil stored up in their heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. One thing I really like about this is just like last week, the emphasis is on the mouth as the thing that, that most often is doing something well and doing something poorly. Um, and here again, the heart refers to identity, a good or a bad person. 
and behavior comes out of that identity, comes out of the core of who we are. And once again, the beginning of where, God, where Paul is starting is to help the people who think of themselves as the good kids understand that they're the guilty. He's saying humanity is actually rotten at the core. The fact that you do evil things means that on a core level, on a heart level, something is phenomenally broken. But we're not going to emphasize this, that this week because we talked a lot about that last week. And what I want to talk about instead is where Paul is pointing with the whole thing. Where is he actually going with this? Because he's setting the stage for the message of the gospel, that what is actually needed here is not a mark on the outside, but is transformation from the inside out. Uh, a completely restored identity, and that a completely restored identity is actually inseparable from the behavior that flows out of it. However, this is an entirely different thing from following the rules. And this is one of those big, this changes everything moments from Romans, particularly from the standpoint of the original hearers. Isn't saying that membership to God's family is indicated by one's lifestyle equal to saying that membership to God's family comes from following the rules? Aren't those things the same thing? No, they're not. Paul is saying this is something that comes about by the Spirit. Circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. So on the one hand, Paul is saying, this is about how you live your life. And on the other hand, he's saying, it's absolutely not about following the rules. Um, the shocking reality of grace is that righteousness is an identity that is gifted by God that changes our lives from the inside out. It's not something that we do. It's not something that we can do. It is something that God does in our hearts and that only God can do in our hearts. And Paul's gonna go on in the part that we read next week to talk about the only thing that we do in this whole thing is, is to enter into this by faith. And we trust in the work of Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection. We trust that the judgment that is to come has already happened on the day of the cross and that we've been invited into the death and the resurrection of Jesus and into the end of an old life and the beginning of a new life. And that as we say yes to that in faith, God marks our hearts with the Spirit. And so through the Spirit, we begin to live out of that new identity. And out of that new identity, we live a transformed life as children of God. So this is actually a complete reversal of what we might have otherwise expected as we read the beginning of the book. Rather than obedience leading to being pronounced righteous and blessed by God, which none of us can actually achieve, God first blesses us with righteousness as a gift. And then out of the gift of that righteous identity flows an entirely new way of living as our behavior flows out of who we are. And so out of com after completely tearing down this whole lie of self-righteousness, this whole lie of entitlement, this whole lie of the good kid identity, what's actually happening is we're being set up to receive that good kid identity back in a new form, in the right form, in a form of a righteousness that is true and good and comes from God as a gift from the Spirit. And you know, going back to the story that I told in the beginning, you know, the, this inability to admit that I was wrong, right, was a self-righteous attitude. Here's a kid who just can't say, yeah, you know, what I did was, was wrong. It was a problem. It's self-righteousness. It's an entitlement. It's not a righteousness that comes from God. And, and a righteousness that comes from God comes with humility, comes with owning our own mistakes. But that sense of being good at the core of my being because I was beloved. That was good. <laughs> that was good on my parents, right? That I would have that sense. We want that, and we want that for everyone. Like I said, I hate the idea that any child might go around feeling like they're just a bad kid in who they are. And the beauty of the gospel is that this is actually something that we can have. This is something that God wants us to have. Now, unlike the good kid identity that comes from just arbitrary family assignment or cultural grouping, this is a righteous identity that's a true identity. When God gives us righteousness, it's real. That we were, we were designed for good. And what God is giving it back to us is the goodness that we were meant for at the core of our being. 
Not because God favors one group over another group. Not because God likes one family better than another family. But because God loves us so much that he's not able to give up on us. And so he makes us into what we would otherwise not be. He makes us someone that we're not. And when God makes us someone that we're not, that becomes someone that we are. And this is available to everyone. And I want to end this morning just by praying for all of us to be just free from every form of self-righteousness. You know, where, wherever, that, wherever that sort of good kid mentality has led us into brokenness, has led us into denial of all of the ways in which we're guilty, and has prevented us from the humility that's required to come before God and say, God, I failed miserably. I want to pray that God would just take that off of us completely and that he would just bring us to that place of total humility and that in that place of total humility that God would fill us with true righteousness, that he'd fill us with the righteousness that comes from him, the knowledge that we are beloved, greatly and deeply beloved, and that God is transforming our identity, making us into somebody that we weren't, but that we are becoming. And that that would just be expressed in every aspect of our lives. So if you can stand up, I just want to pray over us, and then we're going to have a time of worship. The Holy Spirit, God, would you come? Thank you that the only way for us to be part of your family is for you to come and to put your mark on our hearts. And God, ask that you would come and that you would just give us the assurance of that right now. And God, ask that you would just meet us in every every place in our hearts that feels defensive, that feels self-righteous, that feels entitled in any way. And God, would you just melt those things away from us? Would you bring us to a place of humility before you? And God, would you just pour out your love and your goodness on us? Lord, would you transform who we are? Would you make us into the truly righteous? Would you transform us from the inside out? And would you just give us the assurance of your love and the certainty of our identity in you? I pray these things in Jesus' name. So we're going to have a song of worship and then we're going to have a a time of prayer and we'll close the service after that. At the end of each of our services, there's an opportunity to just receive prayer. And you can come up for anything at all, anything that's heavy on your heart, you can come up and and we would love to pray for you. A couple of just specific things. Um, One is, you know, if you just feel God wanting to root out some source of self-righteousness, some source of entitlement in your heart. We would love to just pray with you to be to be rid of that, to be entirely free, that God would just bring you into a place of, of total humility. Um, and then there's a, a second group that's just been really heavy on my heart as I was preparing this message. I think that there are some of us who you may have been a Christian for a really long time. Maybe you're here and this is all new news for you and, and you feel this way. But also maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but you can't seem to shake that feeling in your heart like you're just the bad kid. And, and, and I don't believe that God wants any of us to feel that way. I don't. I believe that God wants to gift you with a, with a completely new sense of yourself. Not in and of yourself, but but through him and by him that he doesn't want anybody to leave this room feeling like they're the bad kid. He wants us to leave this room feeling like we've been like we've been redeemed, like we've been set free from that. And that we are we are loved and that we've been made good. And so if that's you, if you if you just you still feel inside like somehow you're the bad kid. Um, would you come up, we want to pray for you. We want to pray that God will free you from that and he'll give you a much a clear sense of a new identity so if you can hold hands across the aisles we do this each week just as a a symbol of of being a community of love of caring for one another being one together in christ lord would you just as we go from here would you fill us with your love would you fill us with your presence god ask that we would go from here today knowing who it is that we are and what we're about 
and that that would be reflected in the core of our understanding of ourselves and that that would be reflected in every aspect of our lives as you are transforming us day by day. I pray these things in Jesus' name.